And I opened my eye and there was a, a bright light coming in. I couldn't figure out what it is, but I could see the image of what we know of Jesus Christ, Yeshua. And I said, who are you? He said, I'm Yeshua. I said, which Yeshua? <laughs> he said, the only one, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, that is born, died on the cross for you, raised from dead, and is now in heaven. Okay, where is Muhammad in all of this? And he said, Muhammad is dead. <laughs> okay, I know Come he's on. dead. He said, I am that I am. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I have known you and loved you before you were even born. Bishop Hatham Besmar, it's amazing. Thank you so much for coming back here with us. It's great to catch back up with you. It is my pleasure. It's an honor to be with you. And I miss being in California, the good weather that it is. <laughs> Hopefully one of those days we'll, we'll be together in the same studio. But until then, the technology is good. Amen. And it's able to praise the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. And you know, the strange part that is a perfect segue, your video on YouTube, our last interview together, in the YouTube platform garnered more views than anything else we've ever done. Went over 100,000. We never promoted it. We never said a word. God just lifted it through the roof and it exploded. And the question that I kept getting over and over again is people asking some form of, can he tell us more about what Jesus looked like, you know, in person? Because everybody wanted to know he encountered Jesus. Did he see his arms? Did he see his eyes? Did he see his hair? What he looked like? So I got to ask for all the people that were asking. What do you remember in that experience of Jesus' presence, being there with you? I wish you asked me this question earlier. I have a picture of that was uh, apparently drawn out by a 12-year-old in Romania. Mm -hmm. I know. And the picture she drew looks very, very, makes a very close resemblance to the actual appearance of Lord Jesus. Wow. And I wish you asked before, I would have dug it out. Um, if we take a break, I'll dig, I'll dig it out and I can point it in the camera or share it with you and you could put a clip on it. I have no idea who did it. I have no idea the name of the person. I just know it was done by a child who had an encounter and a vision with Jesus Christ. And he gave her the ability to immediately draw it out with a pencil and it is exact resemblance of what i have seen wow very very close um i've had five encounters with our lord and savior and they all he, he looked exactly the same in all of them there was no change whatsoever you said you've had uh, five encounters with jesus so far hate them yes praise the lord wow and were were the other encounters before or after the one at the hospital all of them after the one in the hospital. Okay. So four since then. And how often are have you had these encounters with Jesus? Every encounter I came across, whenever I had an encounter, I was reaching a desperate time in my life. Mm. So then I, within days of reaching a desperate stage, um, I have an encounter to encourage me. Incredible. And so obviously I wouldn't want to be in a desperate stage every five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> we don't uh, need his presence, but we don't want to be desperate. Uh, however, I'm on, I'm on a desperation uh, drive every single day, every moment of our life to seek him. Amen. It, it seems, I mean, obviously in, in our weakness, his power is made perfect. So that would... it. It fits exactly scripturally. And also it occurs to me from Acts 17, 26 through 28, where it talks about we were placed where we are so that we would reach out for him. And so both ways, it seems to me that all that just holds true exactly to his word. How would you encourage all the people that were watching uh, to get closer to God in their own personal circumstance? Well, the problem we have, Christianity and otherwise, we only reach and start seeking the Lord when you're in a desperate situation, when you need something. So our faith is a direct reflection of uh, coinciding with our needs. So he's according to need God. 
I need him, I seek him, when everything goes nice and brilliant in my life, we seem to shy away from the presence of God. It could be that we have gotten too used to his presence on the Christian behalf. On the other people, the only one you feel, when you reach desperation, you try and seek the Lord with all your heart to the best ability that, you, that God gave you. Innately, each and every one of us, when we reach a desperate measure in our life, whether it's trial, tribulation, health issue, financial issue, there is always a need to have a crutch. Mm -hmm. And in the Christian life, that crutch is Jesus Christ. When you're not walking according to Jesus and the life of Christ, then that could be any, uh, a given token of many, many things. But God is always with you. He has Amen. chose you. He has set his son on the cross to save you, not because he's going to shy away when you have a problem. Most Christians think, where is God now? And since I have the distinction of being able to call you bishop as quickly as you have absolutely absorbed, I know you had a goal to memorize the entire Bible, and I'm wondering how close you are to that goal at this point. Well, I am afraid to admit I'm not anywhere closer <laughs> than what we said last, because what I found is I normally, what I'm what I was trying to do before is memorize the Bible by heart. Since then, the more I try to memorize it, the more I find areas of research that I need to dig in to understand it in my heart, as well as memorizing it and printing it, print, imprinting the word into my heart. I think that's what So really the task is taking much longer than initially anticipated. It's because God opens up those words. He just decrypts them and opens up. And when the truth comes in, it's so big and so broad and so massive that every single like phrase becomes like an eternity in itself. At least well, that's my experience. In the book of Jeremiah 33, 3, he said, God will reveal to you things that are unknown to you. And I believe God is, uh, is revealing to me things that I was unaware of unable to understand before and now it's given me the understanding to be able to comprehend these words more and apply them. You see, most people, they, they after they are being saved, after they, they have an encounter, whether at the altar or an actual encounter with Christ, or have a, a repenting moment and they say, I'm giving my life to Christ. A lot of them jump in and they want to live the life of Christ. They want to live according to the Bible. And that's where discipleship is very important because unless you apply the Bible into your daily life, mm -hmm. to every step, everything you're doing, you cannot live it, you cannot be part of it. Amen. And the only way you can do that is by studying it. Mm -hmm. so and the true. more I study, the more I realize I really am I'm, I'm still scratching the surface of God's word. I was going even through the... the uh, recently, I was going through the, the verse in the book of Matthew and, uh, and in the book of Luke, talking about Mary when she broke the flask of oil and poured it on his head. And then started cleaning and wiping his feet with her hair. And I thought, why did she break it rather than opening it? And then I began to realize when you open something, you can close it. When you break it, you have to give it all up. There is no way back. Wow. No return. Well done. Because she knew walking through that room, she was going to be ridiculed. She had a reputation as being the scarlet. She had a reputation where now is not your time. Uh, Judas Iscariot told her, well, we could have spent the money on somebody else on feeding the poor. Right. And that's what happened. A lot of our Christians, unfortunately, feel that if we feed the poor, the poor, that will take place of worshiping God. Yes. That is such but a huge Unless you're broken and come to the Lord with a brokenness, certain brokenness, and pour it all out, you cannot praise Him. That is so and even true. after she left the room, the smell and the scent of the oil reach heaven. Mm. It's so good. Since you... Since we spoke, since I interviewed you last and, and, and the video just exploded, you've also been getting called more and more and more and more on to out for God to use you everywhere. Tell us about what God is doing with how he's moving you out now.
you've also been getting called more and more and more and more on to out for God to use you everywhere. Tell us about what God is doing with how he's moving you out now. Well, we finished a, a second course on the International School of the World, which is how to minister to Muslims. Mm. And my main concern now is reaching out. I'm identifying more with my initial calling. When Jesus saved me, he said, I have so much work for you. You're not done here yet. In that split second of a moment, I thought I died. I think I shared with you last time. Mm -hmm. I went to heaven and they put me to work. But then I realized I'm still on earth, still alive, and he's putting me to work here. So my commission, even though I went off and uh, obtained my credentialing as an ordained minister and then subsequently uh, ordained bishop, I did all of that for man because man needs the, the, the covering, the umbrella. But the commission from God has never changed. So in my opinion, that was a little bit of a diver, diversion from the initial commission because I started teaching on healing, on deliverance, on all of this. And God keeps focusing me back. Your commission is to reach the unsaved. Mm -hmm. It's not for healing and deliverance. That will come while you're reaching the unsaved. You would still have to reach to do healing, to do deliverance, which is what he did when he was on earth. Every time he preached, there was healing and deliverance right. to the multitude. Mm -hmm. And it's such an interesting thing from your perspective. I know that you know many, many, many of the heads of the Middle East. And so from your perspective, how do you see, like, for example, do you believe that there'll be a war between Iran and, and Israel at some point in the not so distant future? Let me explain to you the situation there to the best of my knowledge. All the rallies, all of, even the, 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 the funeral procession that we saw on TV, televised on the Iranian TV, with hundreds of thousands of people going out mourning, they were not. They were forced to do it. When I was a child growing up in Syria, whenever there was a need for the government uh, to rally, to do any kind of demonstration that they wanted, whether it's a celebration or demonstration against anything, they came to schools at all level, universities, government uh, employees, everybody was fooled and was told, bless you, go and do it. You and your family will be in prison. Wow. And there is always uh, the Secret Service watching and taking notes who's out, who's not. One of the picture I showed my wife, actually, uh, I said to her, look at this picture, I'm going to freeze it, and I'm going to show you what I know. So I froze it on my little uh, laptop and enlarged the camera, and I said, look at these two on this side. They're dressed in this leather jacket. Can you just make it? an image in your mind of this leather jacket. She said, yeah. So I moved it to the second point. I said, there's two more wearing the same kind of leather jacket. There's another two here. In the frame of picture, there were over 22 two by twos everywhere, Secret Service standing in the middle of the, of the funeral procession. And I said, do you want to tell me they are all out on their own accord? <laughs> <laughs> what? I mean, Done. unless you know the truth, you say, oh my goodness. And unfortunately, our biased media, our useless waste of space media, have attacked our president and pictured this thug as somebody who is celebrated mm. when he wasn't. Because hundreds of thousands of people died in the Middle East because of him. And unlike the four useless presidents we've had before President Trump, none of them did anything. In fact, they shook hands with him and all of that, which is a disgrace. Mm. Come and if on. our president didn't act the way he did, bless his heart, bless his mind, and bless everything he's doing, and may the Holy Spirit continue guiding him, yes, Lord. we would have had another Benghazi. But the Iranians are so stretched out now. They talk about war. They cannot afford war. <laughs> they have economic sanction everywhere. Their own nation are against them, asking them to step aside, step down, and bring in a, 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 a lawful 
election that would bring somebody legitimate to the to the seat of power, mm. which will not happen. You need another generation of a ruler. So even if they have a legitimate election now, you will have somebody who's still corrupt, somewhat corrupt, somewhat for the nation, somewhat corrupt, because that's what they've all known all their lives since 1979. So it's going to take a one set or maybe two sets of power to change before they get back to normal democratic nation where everything is done democratically the way it should be. Hmm. I have two questions that I still have got to ask you. One of which, just out of concern because I love you, whether or not you're still getting death threats and if you've been safe and your family's good. And the other, how soon you think Jesus is going to return based on what you're getting in the Holy Spirit because I'm hearing feedback from so many people about they believe it's 10 years, 6 years, 30 years just in their own, not that they know, no one knows the day or the hour. But are you safe and is Jesus coming back? How soon? Are you safe and is Jesus coming back? How soon? We are. Jesus, we, I'm, I'm safe definitely because our safety is not in the hands of, of the thugs or somebody who is trying to uh, threaten our life or anything. None of us can go to heaven with one second left for us to be in here. Amen. So no man can change the plan of God and the timing of God. Our lifespan from the time we were born until the time we were dead is registered and written in the book of life. Amen. You want to tell me there is one man that can change that book? If you do, I would like to see him and see what kind of hands he's got. <laughs> <laughs> On the question of when do I think Jesus is going to be returned? I believe if you read the Bible, he said no one, including me, knows the hour. It's only in the Father yep. that knows yeah. the, the, the hour, the minute, and the second. We are to anticipate the return, which what the book of Revelation tells us. We're supposed to be the watchman on the gate. Amen. We're supposed to be sleeping one eye open to make sure we're always anticipating his return, like the bride expecting the groom's return any moment to take her home. So whether he comes back in a day, in 10 years, in 30 years, or 100,000 years, it's his choice, not ours. All Amen. we have to do, as long as we have a breath, his breath in our lungs, we are to serve him. Amen. As long as we are able to speak, we speak his word and his truth to all nations, to all who come encounter with us. Yes. So when they look at us or they hear us, they don't hear me talk, they hear the voice of Christ speaking yes. through my mouth. My lips of clay will only utter his word and put it to his way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And, and people are making tons of money. I mean, I, I know so many authors, I wouldn't want to mention names, that they've made a killing out of making a book, the return, the whatever it is, books they're, they're seeking. That's their choice. But in my opinion, if you are in doubt or you're anticipating the return and you're worried about it, then let's not worry. Let's set our life on the life of Jesus. Amen. And on his commandment and on his commission to go and preach the gospel. Study and prove yourself worthy. Live the truth of the Bible rather than the truth of what you think should be done. Then whether he comes back in a second or a thousand day or a thousand year, it's his choice. All I know, rapture comes, I'm out of here. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm so glad you joined us to bring the Shekinah glory of now five total visitations with Jesus into this and I cannot wait to see how God uses your continuing work. You're preaching out in multiple churches, you're touring in different places, you're going around the world and I just wanna say praise God for all of it. Everything he's brought you from thinking he was not God to knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt he is. <laughs> so when I asked him, why did you have, why did you wait until I was 50 before you saved me? Oh, that's a good question. Well, here is the answer. It's not very good. He said, I didn't trust you before then. Wow. How does that make one be? I get that. Being 50, I get that. <laughs> My God, did you have to wait until I was 50 to save me? 
He said, I couldn't trust you before that. Mm. That yep. makes you want to crawl under something heavy that can sit on you for a while while you're pondering, <laughs> thinking, okay, God, what do I need to do to earn your trust? To have earned your trust before, but you can't go to the past. We can only go to the future. So now we're eager and working on saving the lost, bringing the message of salvation to everybody who hasn't heard it, and seeking his his face, not our own, seeking his name, not our name, and not fame, and putting his glory ahead of all things, and all masters, and all masters, just glorify his name above all names. Thank you for the brilliant advice and the great place to start. We'll also, of course, keep looking back to you as you develop resources and materials, which I'm sure will make it easier to, uh, to speak to these different topics around the world based on all your expertise and having memorized the entire Quran yourself. I, um, I want to thank you so much for, again, spending the time with us and for your brilliant Holy Spirit-guided, biblically-based, wonderful wisdom. Well, it's my pleasure. I, I want to thank you for the privilege and the honor of being on your Godspeed magazine. I want to thank you personally for your friendship and for being there for me always. I'm always there for you, for Godspeed. Amen, brother. And I want to thank you for having the Christ the center of your program and seeking His glory, not ours. Yes. And I will keep you in, in, informed of my, the progress of what God is doing through us. We're not doing anything. He is the one who's doing all the work, and we're just coming by and saying, okay, we're the pretty face behind the work when he's done all the work. Be honest. We're going to have to find I a pretty face. Says, but if you thought Jesus, the donkey must have thought all the crowd were, were hating him at the day of the Passover when Jesus was riding to go into Jerusalem. We're just simply the donkey carrying the message. Man, it's so true. It's so true. Bless you, brother. And for all of you watching, God bless you. And if you bring the full gospel of Jesus Christ, Godspeed. speed.